Hi, everybody. My name is Veronica Diaz, and I am a practicing orthopedic surgeon. Are we getting some, some microphone feedback? Some. Sounds good to hear. Okay. Good to hear. Hi, everyone. My name is Veronica Diaz. I'm practicing. I'm getting horrible echo, though. I can't even hear myself talk. Is there a way around that? How's that? Do you hear an echo now? Okay, great. Good stuff. All right, everybody, my name is Veronica Diaz, and I'm a practicing orthopedic surgeon in Palm Beach County, Florida. I'm also the director of orthopedics at Modernizing Medicine. And I want to thank Dr. Stefan Obini and his wife, Catherine, and UCSF for a great virtual summit. I finished in the OR early today, and I listened to some of the talks, and they were phenomenal. Uh, very scintillating information, very high level, uh, 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 great speakers. Um, I delight in the opportunity to talk to you a little bit about how you can deploy uh, digital health tools to stay afloat in uh, our current uh, environment. And um, I'll start by giving you a little uh, context. First of all, in line with the Code of Ethics, I am a fellow of the AOS. This is my disclosure. I'm the Medical Director of Orthopedics for Modernizing Medicine. Um, I'll cover the current healthcare and economic landscape in the context of the COVID pandemic and specifically orthopedic surgery in the United States. Um, I'll go over some solutions that can help improve efficiency and help you practice virtually, including cloud-based ortho-specific EHR and practice management software. Uh, I'll introduce you to our built-in HIPAA-compliant high-resolution telehealth solution, and I'll review our ro robust um, patient engagement and practice management workflow solutions, as well as our integrated payment processing platform. And I'll leave some time for you to ask questions of, of me, if they're clinical or related to our EHR platform, which is called EMMA, which stands for Electronic Medical Assistant, and to speak with uh, some of our uh, modernizing medicine solutions experts. So this is where we are with COVID-19, a very grim milestone reached this week with uh, over 100,000 uh, deaths here in the United States. Uh, the economic fallout has been uh, devastating. Uh, today, Dr. Uh, Robinson spoke about the 15% national unemployment rate and in LA County, it's apparently 25%. Uh, we were all hoping for a V-shaped recovery, but it's looking more and more like we're gonna get a U or L or swoosh shaped recovery. Um, we always uh, considered healthcare as a relatively recession proof uh, industry. And we're coming to find out that that's not at all the case. Uh, over a million jobs lost in healthcare alone. Uh, these are some of the quotes from uh, the physician practices who responded to the California Medical Association's survey the results were published uh, on April 22nd, and I thought that uh, some of these quotes would resonate with the orthopedic surgeons in our audience. Um, similarly, the AAOS did a member pulse check survey in response to COVID-19, and uh, the results were published uh, last week. It should come as no surprise that most of us see as key challenges maintaining cash flow and revenue, uh, keeping our patients, our, our team members, and ourselves safe and infection-free, uh, continuing to provide care to our patients, 
uh, through uh, telehead telemedicine and covering our overhead. Uh, so I'm going to speak specifically to some of the concerns voiced. Um, it should come as no surprise that almost 80% of AAOS members considered their biggest challenge to be catch up in the next three or four months. And more than half of the respondents indicated that patient retention was a major challenge ahead. Um, patient sentiment is a very important consideration uh, and it really runs the gamut. There are some patients who, who are just uh, patently reckless and or uninformed. And then on the other end of the spectrum, you have patients who, who are really exhibiting an almost pathologic degree of fear. And uh, Dr. Joe Bosco, our current president of the AAOS, spoke to that in his talk earlier in the summit. Um, and uh, that's going to have a lot of effects, not the least of which is to accelerate this trend toward outpatient uh, ASC-based total joint replacement. Part of that is now driven by the fact that patients don't want to go to the hospital to have their, their total hip or total knee or total shoulder. Uh, we all know that patient experience is a key driver of practice success and that patient safety and education are critical to your practice reputation. Um, liability concerns are starting to surface. So many states have issued or granted immunity to healthcare professionals uh, or frontline workers uh, for the clinical decisions that they've made uh, during the uh, duration of the COVID-19 pandemic, but many have not. So the question becomes, how do we address patient, employee, and personal safety and return to our previous level of productivity? Uh, so the projections for COVID-19, and we heard, uh, we heard about this a little bit earlier today with people who have far more expertise than I do, but scenario one um, suggests that the current wave will be followed by a series of smaller waves through the summer and consistently over one to two year period. Uh, scenario two would suggest that COVID is going to follow a similar course the, uh, to the 19, the very devastating 1918 uh, flu pandemic or those in 1957 or 2009 with the uh, H1N1. And then the best uh, case scenario would be scenario number three, where we see this sort of um, slow burn of ongoing transmission and case occurrence. Um, this is what my waiting room looks like now. Up until March 20th, it was standing room only. Uh, there is a little uh, seating area in the lobby of my office building on the other side of that window. And often if I got backed up, that would be uh, filled with my patients. But we've lost our waiting room uh, because with the need to keep our patients safe and mitigate COVID transmission, we really can't have patients in it. So. The bottom line is that COVID isn't leaving us anytime soon, and we really can't keep kicking the can. So how do we achieve this formidable balance act for which there is no blueprint? So we want to uh, ensure safety by minimizing risk, specifically risk of uh, COVID transmission. And we have to balance that against efficiency and quality of care. Um, we know that it is projected, and, and we heard Dr. Uh, 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 Shulman talk a little bit about this, that there's going to be a, a drastic increase in digital tools that help limit physical contact. Uh, we've all come to learn the importance of strengthening the digital infrastructure in our homes. I know in my home, we now have two adults working from home. Um, and uh, specific to our specialty, we're going to see uh, a, a huge trend toward remote clinical monitoring via telehealth, an uptick in the use of wearable devices, and uh, hopefully AI. Uh, so it is my belief that uh, that telehealth will be incorporated into the standard of care, and it's it's been all over the the news, and 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 we're seeing this trend in other industries. So the the in the restaurant industry, which has just been decimated over the past two months, the restaurants that have been able to stay afloat and and solvent are ones that have been able to pivot away from the traditional restaurant experience towards delivery, carry out, curbside pickup. We're seeing an uptick in uh, online uh, uh, banking and mobile payments. And uh, uh, to Dr. Bosco's point in his talk, uh, it's, it's a good question to ask whether these 
uh, conferences and annual society me meetings will one day become a thing of the past. Uh, we're seeing a, a really strong trend toward uh, virtual conferences, webinars, and education. So the question becomes, how can modernizing medicine help you improve efficiency and practice virtually? Um, uh, modernizing Medicine was founded in 2010 by Daniel Kane and my boss, Dr. Michael Sherling. Uh, Dan's first company was Blackboard, which was uh, uh, makes him a pioneer in online education. Uh, he helped take that company public in 2004, and in 2011, I think, uh, it sold for $1.6 billion. Uh, Dr. Sherling uh, comes from academia, he's Harvard trained, and he stayed on as the associate um, residency program director before relocating to South Florida, which is where he met Dan. It was through a physician patient relationship and one thing led to another. Dan was uh, rather shocked to see that Dr. Sherling's office was still on paper. They joined forces, Dan taught Michael how to code and one thing led to another, the birth of modernizing medicine. We now have almost 120,000 end users uh, a little bit over 9,000 of those are in orthopedics. We employ over 800 people and we're headquartered in Boca Raton, Florida with offices in Roseville and uh, Santiago, Chile. And we have consistently been recognized as one of the fastest growing uh, private companies in the country for uh, several uh, of the past few years. Uh, one of the things that differentiates us is that the clinicians, the specialists code into the software uh, there's no doubt we have really brilliant, talented software engineers, but we work in conjunction with them so that the medical content is what our users need. Um, this is what some of our clients have to say about us. So I, I actually, um, I came to be a client of uh, Modernizing Medicine before I onboarded with them. I was with uh, my, my prior EHR vendor. I, I, I I needed to make a change. I was on a remote based server because as a solo practice physician, I couldn't afford an in-house server in terms of just the cost and the maintenance. And uh, really I, I had someone in today's talk mentioned that it was really just uh, an analog solution in the guise of digital technology. And that's really what I, I, was, I was working with. Um, I was paying $1,500 a month in transcription fees. Um, it was very scan intensive. I was on separate uh, uh, platforms for EHR and for practice management. So it was buggy, the interface would break down. And, and when I looked around at what my peers were using in other surgical specialties and in orthopedics, everyone that I really um, held in high esteem around me was on modernizing medicine. So I had a look and I just haven't turned back. And I really do think that we are um, very uniquely positioned to become the uh, go-to uh, orthopedic platform for the orthopedic private practice market. And the reason I think we're different is because we're specialty specific. Um, our orthopedic specific medical content is unparalleled. We're entirely cloud-based, which means that you can access um, our software from anywhere. Uh, we're touch-based, so we have browser-based, web-based uh, software, but uh, in the office, uh, going from patient room to patient room, it's tablet based, which is great because it's interactive. I actually document synchronously with seeing patients and they love it. They really feel like they're part of the process. And then perhaps our biggest differentiator is that our software is intelligent and adaptive. It actually, um, the machine learning built into the software, it learns your preferences for diagnoses and treatment plans so that you just get faster and faster as time goes on because those things are, are brought to the forefront and they help improve your workflow. So we offer everything from EHR, practice management, business operations services, including uh, revenue cycle management through ModMed Boost um, and very robust analytics so that you can keep your finger on the pulse of the financial health of your practice and also for patient outcomes and patient monitoring. Um, in response to COVID-19, we launched a beautiful telehealth platform that's built into our software, uh, and we have uh, really robust patient engagement uh, tools. We also interface with WebPT, which sort of dominates the physical therapy market, and uh, with uh, Ombra Health for the PACS side. 
Uh, we have built-in clinical decision support systems, data analytics, and we have an in-house MIPS advisory uh, service. So let me kind of take you through a simulation of what the virtual practice experience would look like on ModMed. And I have uh, personally benefited tremendously from all of this functionality. So the patient has the ability to self-schedule their appointment from your practice website or uh, through a recall message or their portal. The practice management software then performs an eligibility check. Patients can load their medical history through the portal. That includes their insurance, their demographics, their medical history, their pharmacy. The patient will receive an appointment reminder, which helps reduce no-show rates. You can deploy on-demand messaging to send mass notifications to patients. And on March 20th, when Governor DeSantis issued the executive order um, stopping all elective surgery, this was really powerful. Instead of having to individually call every patient, I was booked out six weeks at that point, both in the office and surgically. And so it was helpful to just send a message out to everyone. We'll call everyone on an individual basis. And also, we used it to let them know what the new screening criteria and requirements were for an in-person visit to wear a mask, that they couldn't bring people with them, et cetera, et cetera. On an individual less, uh, level, you can send uh, secure messages to patients. Patients can log into the telehealth visit via a smartphone-based app or their portal. And then the physician can conduct the virtual office visit with the patient and uh, document synchronously. We have auto-suggested coding. Our practice management software scrubs the claim and submits it to the clearinghouse. We use Trizetto. And then everything the physician does happens digitally. So if I order an MRI, it, it gets sent digitally uh, to the imaging facility. Prescriptions get sent electronically and patient education materials post to their portal without my ever having to print out a piece of paper. Uh, we recently launched ModMed Pay, which allows patients flexibility in how they pay. And this is really important given the shift towards uh, consumer responsibility with uh, healthcare costs. And then finally, uh, we um, can help you gather feedback via email or text through our patient surveys. So in essence, we have an all-in-one integrated suite. We help engage patients in their healthcare, which we all know leads to improved patient outcomes. And, and I should mention that Modernizing Medicine's uh, company mission is to transform the way that healthcare is, uh, information is created, utilized, and consumed to drive practice efficiency and improve patient outcomes. We support virtual office visits. We help you maintain the solvency of your practice and operations from a distance. And if you're worried about the transition, I know that's a pain point for a lot of people, we are very well positioned to train you and help you go live quickly and remotely. So for people who have never seen our platform, I just wanna show this video. Um, our EHR is called EMMA, which stands for Electronic Medical Assistant. It has a built-in nuanced speech-to-text functionality, which is fantastic. If you were dismayed with natural language processing five or six years ago, have another look. It's come a long way. This is a patient with a slap lesion. I'm entering the diagnosis. And you can see that the minute I do that, all of the plans that populate are things that I would do if I was seeing a patient with a slap tear. Counsel them, image interpretation, order of an MRI, giving them a sling, and ordering, them, uh, ordering surgery. So... Uh, that's sort of a little uh, brief intro into our platform. Um, I also love that you can um, take pictures. So in an earlier talk, they, they talked about how we really have to rethink how we document clinically. Uh, and one of those is through pictures. So these are x-rays that are appended to the note, uh, but I almost exclusively document um, shoulder range of motion with pictures. Uh, it's more accurate uh, and it's audit proof. And I also see a lot of patients with Dupuytren contracture. So I take pictures of the hand in the coronal and sagittal plane, uh, and there's really just no substitute for that. I really don't have time to go over everything that we offer, but uh, most germane to the situation that we find ourselves in is telehealth. Uh, we have a beautiful solution that's integrated into our platform. It's HIPAA secure, uh, which is important because as all of these sort of uh, uh, softening of, of regulations 
sort of sunset, uh, you want to be on something that gives you a long-term solution. The resolution on the camera is great. It supports using the front and back facing cameras on the smartphone app. And, uh, and we also have a patient engagement portfolio. So telehealth's been all over the news, uh, including our own Joe Harpaz, president and COO of Modernizing Medicine. He featured five reasons why telehealth is here to stay through COVID and beyond in his uh, standing Forbes column. Uh, even before COVID, telehealth saw a 340% increase in growth over a four year period. And just to give you a, a benchmark, EHR saw about a 68% increase in that same period. Uh, not surprisingly, there was a 50% surge in application or in adoption in March. And the trajectory is forecast close to 1 billion virtual encounters in 2020. Uh, and as I mentioned, just be wary of using something that is permissible now, but uh, only during the duration of the public health emergency. So this is what our web or browser based uh, uh, user interface looks like. And this is how easy it is to uh, invite a patient to telehealth. You, they'll receive a text notification on their smartphone. They'll click on the link. And then that link opens up our pocket patient app. And with their last name and their date of birth, they can log in, accept the terms of service, and then join the video visit so that they can have their visit, their appointment with the physician. And most recently, what we did was we recognized that a lot of practices may have antiquated hardware, their desktops may not have built in audio or visual uh, or video functionality. So we uh, created telehealth directly from the iPad. And it works very similarly. You invite the patient and um, they'll join the chat when you launch the video. And so that way you can take the visit straight from your um, from your iPad. And then this is just super slick. You can minimize the chat window and you can move it around the screen so that you can access different parts of the chart if you wanted to document synchronously. One of the things I'm most excited about, and it's just a testament to how forward thinking this, this company of which I am part uh, is, is the, uh, the, the, in, the launch of mobile intake, which is uh, expected sometime this summer. So the way it works now is the patient can enter their information on the portal, or the way most of my patients had been doing it before March 20th was when they got to the office for their appointment, they were handed a tablet. And we have an app that's patient facing called the kiosk. And then on the kiosk, they would enter all of their information. But now we've lost our waiting room. That tablet is a shared device. You don't want to cross contaminate and cause issues with COVID transmission. So what we've done is made all of that functionality available on our smartphone app. That way, when the patient arrives in the parking lot or outside your building, since there's no waiting room, they can get the ball rolling on all of this before they even set foot into your office to, to help drive efficiency. And this is sort of what the interface looks like, super patient friendly and saves, uh, saves a lot in overhead because you don't need someone else to manually do this intake. So just to take you through what a simulation would look like of this, the patient will receive an appointment reminder via text. They'll reply to the office upon arrival. The office will then send a secure message to the patient confirming receipt that they've arrived and reminding them to wait outside. And then what happens is that the patient will appear under what's called office flow as being in the parking lot or outside the building. And when the physician or MA is ready for the patient, they can just press the call button and it alerts the front desk for, um, that the, the physician is ready to see the patient. So you can see how for the small practice, only one physician or maybe a small group, this really helps streamline operations where we're really getting squeezed and there's a lot of consolidation pressure. But for big practices where, you know, maybe uh, the there's 24,000 square feet of office space, this functionality and integration is really meaningful. Uh, I want to wrap up by telling you that we recently uh, launched Mod Med Pay to great success. Um, so, uh, one of the talks, uh, uh, Dr. Um, Robinson, uh, the economist uh, professor at, at Berkeley was talking about how there's been this really tremendous shift because of high deductible plans. Um, 
towards uh, consumer responsibility for payments. And so you want to make it as flexible as possible for your patients to pay you. So with ModMed Pay, you can do so through the portal. You can do text to pay. And forthcoming is affording your patients the flexibility of getting care, but having a payment plan. And through ModMed Pay, the system will automate the payment processing on the agreed upon date. And by the way, ModMed Pay works with, there's no PIN uh, or login requirement. You can also have a hot button on your website. This is my website. I have a hot button where patients can pay their bill with the click of a button. And it also works with uh, Apple Pay. Um, I finally want to just make a pitch for ModMed Boost. Uh, if for whatever reason you've had to furlough some of your back office and you're running a, a pretty anemic back office team or let's say that you um, outsourced your billing and that uh, third party associate didn't make it through COVID uh, financially, uh, we offer ModMed Boost, which is a comprehensive billing and collections management. Uh, most of the people there have practice management experience. You'll be assigned a dedicated client manager and we help you do monthly financial health checks and maintain the financial transparency of your practice uh, in the event of an audit. So ModMed Boost is, is, is really uh, incredible because it, it helps scale with your orthopedic surgery practice and business. So the bottom line is uh, we're here for you. Uh, I, I really do think that we're gonna be the dominant player for the orthopedic private practice market and spanning just the small practice and the, the giant multi-location cross state practices. And, and we've proven that with our current clientele. So I thank you greatly for your attention. Um, I, I wanna make myself available to the orthopedic surgeons who might be interested in learning more about modernizing medicine. My contact information is available through the societies, uh, AAOS, the Shoulder Society, and the Hand Society, or you can email me, uh, Veronica, uh, Veronica Diaz at uh, modmed.com. Uh, and uh, without uh, further ado, I delight in introducing Chris Ann Fieldhouse, who is our Vice President of Product Management, and Aaron Daniels, our Payments Onboarding and Support Manager. Uh, Chris Ann is, um, has been with the organization for quite some time. Uh, her primary focus is on practice management and operations. She currently leads the strategic efforts to further develop modernizing medicines, practice management and analytics solutions to help bring operational improvements to the specialty healthcare markets. Erin is our payments uh, onboarding and support guru. She joined ModMed in 2016 as one of the first practice management educators that led practices through the transition from their previous software to ModMed practice management. Um, and her specialty lies in facilitating practice growth, utilizing EHR, PM, and other digital technology to maximize productivity and implementing new revenue streams within the practice. Erin um, has a strong clinical background. She started out as an emergency room tech and then as a, a surgical tech, and then she worked as a practice manager at Northwestern uh, Medicine. So uh, I am going to take these slides down so I can see what questions have been asked. Hi, ladies. Hello. So I have a couple questions. Um, the first is, if you are talking to an orthopedic surgeon, I'm gonna give this one to Chris Ann. If you're talking to an orthopedic surgeon and they're calling you, they've had to furlough their office staff, what sort of tools or advice would you have for them to reopen their practice uh, with only clinical staff? Sure. Um, it's really a heavy focus on patient engagement tools to connect with the uh, patients. So as you had mentioned, on-demand messaging, sending out broadcast messaging to allow, to notify your patients the practice is still open, um, implementing some type of secure messaging so that you can communicate with your patients when they arrive in the parking lot. So a chat between um, the patient and the clinical staff, uh, notifying that the patient has arrived and encouraging when they can come into the office, and also really utilizing um, benefits of the patient portal. 
So the ability to log in ahead of time, update past medical, social, family history, pharmacy, medications, really collect pertinent demographic information prior to the visit. So you're taking it away administratively as much of the um, work that you need to do. And yeah. Go ahead. Sure. And from a payment perspective, you know, a system that offers automation um, and notification of co-pays and out-of-pockets, ease of collecting that and utilizing a system that has payment plans and text to pay if you need to do collections post-visit. That's great stuff. And I know we have deployed that to great success at my practice. I, I really have to watch literally every cent because I'm by myself. So I'm like a, a little salmon swimming upstream and it's really helped offload uh, so much for my for my practice and my practice manager. I, I have a staff of two right now. So I had a part time x ray tech prior to uh, COVID. Uh, she left us actually for unrelated reasons. Um, she, I would not have been able to, to keep her employed through the hit that we took over the past six weeks. Um, so I'm going to give Aaron another question. Uh, as the payment landscape has become more heavily patient focused, how does our ModMed platform help improve patient, um, patient collection efforts? There's a lot of things that our development team have built in to really help with that collection. And, um, you know, you talked previously about uh, portal payments, um, being able to pay on the portal at their own convenience. Um, so a client or a patient could actually be at home and, you know, at night be able to log in and pay their bill. Um, we have quick pay options that are available as well. So they'll get a text message um, saying your balance is due. They can do it straight from their phone. So no matter where they're at, they can go ahead and, and make an appointment. Um, one of the things that is coming out very soon um, that we're gonna have is payment plans, um, which is really gonna help the practice to be able to communicate and work with their with their patients and help them through this, this trial time they'll be able to set up payment plans for the for their patients um, that they decide and they approve and then it's going to move um, seamlessly through the system so that's not only going to help their patients but it's also going to help their staff like you said you're down staff you're down a couple of people um, the payments are going to come directly into the system and they're going to already be linked with that patient name so all they need to do is accept it and apply it to the line items so it's really a win-win for both the practice and for the um and for the patient for sure we i just want to take a moment to answer a question that came in uh how do you do online visit with filling in these forms on a smartphone if the patient is not very fluent with smartphone or has some visual problems well if the patient is visually impaired this is probably not the solution for them uh, in terms of uh, smartphone, I would say uh, I'm in South Florida, so my population is about 50% commercial insurance and 45% Medicare, so I have a huge Medicare population. And I am quite impressed with how facile my patients are with their smartphones. So I would say that the average octogenarian, at least in my area, um, can negotiate their smartphone very well. But yes, there are going to be exceptions to any every rule. And I think the interface is very simple and patient friendly. I think some of the highest marks we receive is on our kiosk platform. I sometimes enter the room as the patient is giving us five stars and they're so grateful not to be handed a clipboard with a stack of papers this big where their hand is cramping by the end of it. I and know, he is, did you also see all of the educational material that our team had built up for um, for our clients as well? Yes, for sure. Yeah, so they actually created pamphlets for the practice to hand out to their patients so that they can um, actually you know, walk them through setting it up on their phone and connecting to the office. So kind of taking that next step and providing a PDF so that the office can hand that out to the out to their patients. I'm really glad you brought that up because some practices, especially now, really they, they just don't have the bandwidth to do the heavy lifting in terms of getting patients onboarded. And I, I want everyone on the call to know that on our website, we do a lot of that for them. So you can have a link from your practice website to ModMed that helps patients download 
their um, their smartphone app and gets them onboarded. Uh, Chris Ann, yes. How does our practice management system help handle case management processes? Uh, great question. So we invested um, quite a bit in regards to workers' comp, auto, PIP, um, insurance claims. So we have a separate case management system where um, the end user can open a separate case per injury and it tracks all visits, all documentation on a case specific basis. And for an automation from billing, you can tie the claim to the case and we offer electronic billing where all the forms are coming over. And based on provider documentation, the system is generating some of the state required forms that go through. So much of the manual paperwork that has to be completed and sent to the workers comp carrier, we've gone through and we've automated it. So it's really um, made it a much uh, easier lift for our providers, especially when you're seeing a patient for a shoulder injury and then they trip in, they break an ankle and you have to look at something else that's, uh, you're evaluating something else, keeping those cases separate are so key to ensure your revenue cycle isn't um, affected. Yeah, it just would be silly to not, not use those tools. It's just time wasted and we don't really have any time to waste. So, or resources, it's, it's, it's a matter of resources. So, um, Aaron, I've got one for you. Okay. You ready? Sure. If I am considering switching systems and I want to limit in-person contact and travel, what options are there for virtual training and go live? And what kinds of training do you offer and what's the implementation timeframe? So that is a great question. And um, some of this I could actually speak to from firsthand experience. So not only was I an educator uh, for the system, but um, I also had the opportunity, one of the practices I worked with in the Chicagoland area, onboarded um, with, um, with Emma um, back in the day. And so one of the unique things that uh, this company does is provides online training. And so using web versions and things like that, we can actually train and we have the materials uh, for the teams so that they can, we can separate it if you're doing a full suite, bringing on Emma and on the practice management side. Um, we have separate trainers uh, that will be working with each of the teams and they are very good at breaking it out um, so that there are desktops that they can learn on. There's active learning. Um, instead of just watching a video that's paused on a regular basis so that um, the, the additional, the team members at the office can work on it together. And one of the things that's provided, which I've, I have not seen in most other uh, systems that I've worked in, is a sandbox that the practice actually gets to practice in. And so that is is an enormous uh, feature to be able to utilize. So you can take that training just into the everyday part of your practice. I usually recommended that um, when we would do a training with somebody, they, they commit to doing five minutes during their lunch to practice something that we learned for that week until they came in again. And so with being able to do that, um, you know, once the contracting and all that fun stuff is completed, we can usually get a practice up and going uh, depending on how many um, other uh, features they're going to be loading in there within, within two or three months or so. So it can be a relatively shorter um, training period for it. So um, it's very, it's very exciting. It's actually, you know, one of the things that really stuck out in my mind um, being a practice manager and actually working with people who knew what they were talking about. They worked in the offices. So for me to ask a question on my workflow or something like that, it was, and I, they were like, oh, well, we've kind of done it like this. So com something completely different than any of the other systems I've worked with before. So. Veronica, yes. If I can add, during COVID, uh, you know, it's been pretty amazing. We've had practices that have taken advantage of the downtime with patients and have continued with implementations. And we have the ability to um, do remote training. And so during go lives, we have staff that actually monitors the, mem the 
team members using the system and provides feedback and so forth. So, uh, you know, where we're seeing in some other areas that clients are pushing back implementations, we're, we're seeing more implementations move forward, which is great. And the feedback we're getting from clients is really good because they're not having to cut schedules when they're ramping back up. So they're really making great use of time for their staff to become ingrained in the system. That's a great point. I couldn't think of a better time to capitalize on this opportunity to sort of shift gears when when we're a little bit slower. Mm -hmm. and, and ultimately it's cost saving, right? So yeah. so what other what other um, what other things would you like to mention that you think our users should hear um, about our that differentiates us? Is there something we haven't covered that we should? I think from a practice management standpoint, um, we do really focus on the verticals and the needs of the verticals, even looking at our analytics platform, the reporting that we provide and the level of oversight. We definitely have a vertical focus and, you know, we have our general managers of the vertical that are providing us feedback from the different stakeholders, our clients, prospects, etc. And on the PM uh, side of the house, we have an advisory board. It's in, we call it the advanced users board. And we have a collection of our um, ortho users that are part of that group. We meet quarterly and we run through and we uh, go through what we're developing, obtain feedback, walk from surveying. So our clients really have a chance to provide feedback into what we're developing. And we really have had greater success on that because there's nothing worse than releasing a product that no one's looked at and people are like, this is not what we expected. So um, we have really great collaboration with our clients and I think that has really led into our success. Yeah, I agree. I think, mm -hmm. you know, from my standpoint, I, you know, I'm in private practice. I, I don't think I, I don't think I have the stomach for academia and I don't really publish, but I was always looking for a way to to have an impact on my profession and 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 help my peers on a larger scale. It's great to take care of patients. I love that. I wouldn't trade it for the world, but it really is um, it, it really is powerful to have signed on with modernizing medicine and 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 be able to uh, to, to to impact my profession on a larger scale. Uh, it really has changed the way I practice. I, I, I operate very independently in the office. I see patients in the room by myself. And the fact that I send off the MRI or I send off the script for therapy or I book surgery right in the room, all of my documentation is done. The note is finalized before the patient has even walked out the door ha has just been uh, uh, really really powerful and and I know that EHR is not a sexy topic for most physicians and specifically orthopedic surgeons and it's not because we're not innovators. I mean we heard the talks that came up at the summit. We are innovators by nature but we like to drive that process. And the thing about modernizing medicine is that they really they engage and employ physicians to help drive that process and and so I guess I'll end on that unless there are any other questions. I think I'm looking at the question box. What is the cost of this software for the physician? How can you perform a physical exam, for example, knee or ankle during an online visit? So we have, let me ask, uh, answer that one first. We have built-in tele telehealth exams, which uh, allow you to capture range of motion and inspection of the skin, but leave out stability testing or strength testing. As far as what the cost of this software for the physician is, great question, and I'll defer to orthosales at modmed.com. Um, I think we got them all. Chris and Aaron, I value you both so much uh, as colleagues and for your expertise. Mm -hmm. So um, I think we'll wrap it up there. Unless there are any more questions, I'll give it another 10 seconds or so. Again, I want to thank the Beanies for hosting a great summit. I'm great. I'm happy to have wrapped it up and I really enjoyed the talks today.